everybody headed this way. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to my presentation. I'm going to talk about something that I think is very important uh, for voting. Uh, just sort of uh, looking at the big picture, I really want to encourage college students to vote. As you may know, um, as a block, college students don't vote very much. And they're, they're one of several demographic or, or groups that you could describe that don't vote. And the problem with that, folks, is that if, if, if a block of people like college students or young people don't vote, politicians are going to exploit you. They're going to, they're going to dump the tax burden on you. They're going to write legislation without, with your uh, interest completely out of the picture. And so um, we got a big election coming up, so I'm glad to see uh, some students interested in politics. And I would encourage you to not only think about some of the types of um, voter suppression uh, and problems with the election system, but also don't be discouraged. Register to vote, get involved, learn, learn the candidates, figure out which ones align with your interests, because that's what the po political system is all about. And if everybody did that, we'd have a much, much more functional system. Uh, I guess I should introduce myself. I'm uh, Gary Brinker. I'm in the uh, sociology department, so I'm not a po political scientist. But I am a sociologist that is very interested in politics. You know, that's one difference is the political scientists tend to focus on studying just the political institution. What I like about sociology is we look at all the many different societal institutions and how they kind of interact and affect each other. So um, this presentation got advertised as voter suppression, and I am going to talk about some, some different types of voter suppression, but I am going to focus my discussion here on gerrymandering. And I've got a little handout there. I'm actually at one point in the presentation. I'm going to actually show you how to gerrymander. Uh, this presentation came from a New York Times article from September 10th entitled Republican Gerrymander Wiz Had Wider Influence That Was Known. And of course, this Wiz they're talking about is a man named Thomas Hoffeller, who basically innovated, uh, found a way to innovate some megadata on voting and to use some sophisticated analysis techniques to actually uh, gerrymander and give uh, the party that he worked for, which of course was the Republican Party, a big advantage in several elections. And I understand he was paid quite well for that. So, you know, learning how to gender mandate, uh, assuming they don't abolish it like I would like them to, uh, may be a potential uh, career path for you. And I'm going to get you started here because I'm not going to teach you everything that you need to know. I'm not going to teach you everything Mr. Hoffeller knew, but I'm going to teach you the basics of how um, gerrymandering works. So gerrymandering of district lines, and we're talking about you know, voting districts, um, is one of several practices that can give a certain party an electoral advantage. Now, we've had some of these advantages since the beginning of our country. As you may know, we've got the US Senate. Now, in the House of Representatives, every representative represents roughly the same number of people, same number of citizens. In the US Senate, it's different, because every state gets two senators and states vary markedly in their population levels. It varies quite a bit. For example, Bernie Sanders, um, Senator Bernie Sanders, represents approximately 313,000 constituents. Senator Kamala Harris, on the other hand, represents 20 million constituents. So if you think about that, the, the criticism is that the people in Vermont, the voters in Vermont, have 60 times per person uh, the, the power in the Senate as citizens of California. Um, another thing that's been around pretty much the whole, or for our whole history has been the way we elect a president, not by popular vote, but by through a system called the Electoral College, which is kind of the, similar to the Senate in that the Electoral College tends to give a disproportional amount of say in who the president is to states that, have, that are sparsely populated. And of course, Kansas would probably be included in, in one of those. Um, and this effect can actually cause the candidate with the most votes to actually lose the, the election. This has happened four times in our history, and it's actually happened twice in our recent history. Now, some of you may be too young to remember the 2000 election, but in that election, Al Gore, even though, as you can see, he garnered almost a half a million more votes than George W. Bush, he ended up with five fewer electoral votes. That was one of the closest presidential elections in our history. 
and it was actually determined by a decision by the floor, by the Florida Supreme Court as far as who which candidate would get Florida's electoral votes because the Florida election was so close. And then of course we saw a, an ex really extreme example in our most recent election, which I hope you all remember, where in which Hillary Clinton garnered almost three million more votes than Donald Trump. But yet look how many more electoral votes. Donald Trump got 77 more electoral votes than Hillary Clinton. Described it as a landslide win. So when you can have a landslide win, when you get three million less votes than your opponent, there's something wrong there. I suggest there's something wrong there to me. So gerrymandering is one of several practices that uh, give certain parties an electoral advantage. So voter suppression, these voter suppression strategies are, are, are more recent phenomenon. And there's going to be several of these that uh, are possible for parties uh, to, to uh, capitalize on. Uh, here in Kansas, we passed legislation that now requires proof of citizenship to register to vote, and typically that means either a birth certificate or a passport. And then in addition to that, when you actually go to cast your vote, you've got to show a government-issued photo ID before you'll be permitted to vote, even if you're registered. And the, the, these changes were made, of course, in the name of voter integrity, election integrity. Um, as you may know, our own Chris Kobach is sort of famous for the last 10 years. He's been trying to find evidence of widespread voting fraud. Most would agree that he has not had much success in that. Uh, so what that suggests, if that's not really a legitimate reason, and there's actually much more uh, evidence to support uh, the assumption that meeting these requirements is less feasible for certain categories of voters. For example, students, the elderly, minorities, ethnic minorities, and the poor. You guys are mostly students, right? You probably all have a photo ID, right? Is anybody here that does not have a photo ID, a government a driver's license with a picture on it? That's not a problem for you, but how many of you could lay your hands on your birth certificate? Okay, some of you, how many couldn't? Or it's probably back home, right? Somewhere your parents have it somewhere. It's going to be a little bit more difficult for you to lay your hands on your birth certificate. The elderly, think about it. The elderly, I mean, some people were born so long ago in a rural area, they may not even been issued one. But even if they were, they've had more time to lose it because they've had more time to move, lose their, their uh, birth certificate, or just a long time since I've ever needed it. And I really, I don't, I don't, I'm not even sure where it is. Um, with ethnic, uh, with the poor, I guess I should say, the, uh, well, true with ethnic, um, with the elderly too, the elderly are less likely to drive, right? So they're going to be less likely to have a photo ID. The poor, of course, because they can't, either can't afford a car or the poor disproportionately live in the inner city where it's not practical to own a car. You can get everywhere you need to go by either walking, taking a bus, a cab, or a train. And then, of course, ethnic minorities who tend to fall disproportionately in the poor, they're going to be disproportionately affected by, these, um, by this, this uh, voter suppression strategy. Another voter suppression strategy are things like limiting early voting. Early voting is when you, know, you have election day. Early voting is when you're given a time, a few days usually, or maybe a week or two before that, to go to a certain place and, and cast your vote early. Um, so that's what early voting is. So either eliminating or lim eliminating early voting, uh, the number or you know convenience of the locations of the polling stations, the amount of days and hours the polls are open. Usually it's just one day. You've got voting day, and maybe it's from seven to eight or nine. Um, but there's limited times that you can vote. And the problem with this is that what that does it sets up a situation where upper class people, it's just easier for us to vote. Um, anybody that works here, I think, just about, certainly I leave whenever I want, as long as I don't have a class, to go vote. And so I always go in the middle morning or middle afternoon, and every time I go, maybe there's a few people in line, but it's very short. I can get in there and vote and get out of there in 15 minutes. On the other hand, people like, I'm sure many of you, how many of you work part-time jobs? Let me ask you this, would your boss let you leave in the middle of your shift to go vote? If he or she did, they'd probably ask you to clock out, right? So it's going to be, again, less convenient for you to go vote than it is, than it is for me or, or most of the faculty and staff here. 
uh, and then limit, limiting the um, location of polling stations too. Uh, either limiting the number, which means that the average voter has to drive farther, and again, it's transportation is easier for upper class people. Um, what about just the location of them? If you put the location in places that are convenient for the upper class, I know I vote at the Smoky Hill Country Club, where basically all the elites in Hayes play golf, right? So, I mean, it's not hard for me, but if I play golf, you know, well, we're going to play golf this afternoon. We can just go in and, and vote before we go out on the links. You see what I'm saying? It's just going to be, it's a situation where it's more important for a certain type of, uh, more easy to vote for a certain type of person. Preventing convicted felons from voting. There's nowhere in the Constitution that says felons should be prohibited from voting. There's nothing in the Constitution that authorizes lawmakers to forbid convicted felons from voting. Yet, we see that there are three states, Florida, Kentucky, and Virginia, that have permanently prohibited all citizens who've committed a felony from voting. You know, you're convicted of a felony for the rest of your life, you can't vote. Now you'll notice I've got Florida in red, because you may know Florida, actually last November, the Florida voters, and a big chunk of them, because they've actually passed a state constitutional amendment which typically means you got to get at least two-thirds of the voters to pass that, so it was very popular, passed an amendment that says that after convicted felons have served their sentence, and that includes parole and probation, once they've fulfilled all those, this, this amendment says that they should now be able to vote after that. Well, that was good, of course, but last summer, the Republican, of course, legislature passed a law that added another requirement that they had to pay for all of their court fees and fines too, as well as that. So again, some political factions try to make it easier for felons. Of course, you know, you could argue it's debatable as to whether felons should be able to vote or not, of course. Um, I personally think it makes sense to me, and once you paid your debt, uh, certainly that you should be able to vote. But that is one way that, uh, that voting is, is suppressed. Also, um, Overton, um, the author of, of one of the books I read, cited several advanced countries as well as developing countries, as you can see, that actually allow inmates to vote. So you don't even lose your voting privileges when you get sent to prison in, in these countries. But yet, we, most states, put permanent bans on those. Purging of infrequent voters from the voter registration list. This is, uh, you know, some people vote every time. They're very politically active. They vote every time. Other people just vote in the presidential elections, or maybe if they reason, well, I really don't care. I like both candidates just as much. I don't care who wins, so I'm not going to vote this time. And typically, you would you you would still stay on registration. I mean, they they a lot of a lot of times have had if it's like 10 years since you voted, and they assume you're dead or move somewhere, they take you off. But this least, this recent movement. Uh, cuts you off at, at much shorter times after the last time you registered or, or voted. So that means people that think I can vote, they go down to the polls, they may stand in line for an hour and a half and get up there and find that, oh, your name has been removed from the voter registration list, you can't vote. You're going to have to register to vote again before you can vote. Now, um, I would say, I mean, I just actually saw this. It was in Monday's uh, edition of the New York Times. There was a story about an attempt in, by Ohio legislators to pass a law to, uh, I can't remember if I had the number, but I do know that it was, it was a long list of people that were going to purge from the vote, and somebody took a closer look at that list and realized that 20% of the people on that, vote that, on that list that they were going to purge from the voter registration list uh, did not belong on that list. And, um, as far as I know, they never did do that. They never did do that. That kept them from doing that. But there are um, many attempts to try and do that. And then this is probably the most recent innovation. Um, this um, this movement to add a what's called a citizenship question on the U.S. Census. Um, you know, the the basically the Constitution mandates that the country conduct the census every year, mostly for the purpose of distributing electoral seats. Um, but the census has sort of grew and, and assumed more uses over the years. 
So a lot of questions have been added on that are not constitutionally mandated, and certainly there's no mandate to count immigrants, documented or undocumented immigrants. The Constitution just says you will count people. So this is not, it's not a constitutionally authorized thing. And basically the criticism is that if you put a question on there asking people to tell whether they're a citizen or not, that not only undocumented immigrants, but even documented immigrants will be inhibited from participating in the census. And the implications of that, of course, are that that would cause states that have high numbers of immigrants to be undercounted in the, cen in the census, which means that they would, be, uh, they would get underrepresented in the legislature. Uh, feel free to raise your hand if you have any questions in the middle of this. So, you know, if all of these policies affected all, all or both parties equally, they really wouldn't be a problem. Voter suppression wouldn't be a problem. In fact, many would argue it probably wouldn't even exist if it affected both parties equally. But the fact is, if you look at it, if you look at how it's implemented, you do find pretty um, obvious evidence that these policies do tend to affect the Democratic vote. In other words, students, the elderly, minorities, the poor, um, infrequent voters, um, convicted felons, and immigrants tend to be Democrats. So if all of these strategies negatively affect Democrats, then there's not going to be much motive for Republicans to change these. Which is, which is why I really I centered on gerrymandering, because gerrymandering is one of the things that affects, as we'll see, both parties equally. So it is going to be more feasible to do something about gerrymandering. So what is gerrymandering? To, know what, to, to understand what gerrymandering is, you first have to understand the basics of how we determine the congressional districts in, in our country. And this, again, is constitutionally mandated. The Constitution allows each state to send one representative to Congress for each, uh, let me say, n number of people. And this number of people here, right now it's about 747,000. The way they get this is they take the total number of seats available and, and they divide that by the, the, the census count. And that's why the census is so important to know what is the number of people that are needed for each state, for each congressional seat that they need. So what that means is for each state, and since Kansas has about a little over three million people, we have four, four of these representatives. But each state, for every 747,000 people they have, they get assigned one legislative seat for their state. Now, as you know, we're, they're going to do a census next year. And these things change because people migrate. People migrate into states from out of the country, and people migrate within states. So, you know, when you have these censuses, states that have high fertility or have encouraged immigration, in migration, they're going to tend to have a higher proportion of states, and they may actually gain a seat from, from a particular census. Another state that has low fertility and low in migration, maybe high out migration, a state like that could actually lose a seat in this process. So each state government, after the, after the census has been done and they calculated the number and assigned the number of seats that each state gets, then each state government is responsible for drawing a district uh, for the election of each representative for each one of those districts that they've been assigned. And, you know, the typical norm has been that the party in power has the authority to draw these district lines. And this really hits at the root of why gerrymandering is possible. So the party also, party power also draws the district lines for state legislators as well. And Kansas has 125 state legislative districts and 40 state senatorial districts. So the uh, the party in power is going to draw the, you know, the lines to, to make where the four federal districts are, as well as the, the smaller areas that, that will define the 125 legislative districts and the 40 senatorial districts. And the only criteria, the only rule that they have to follow is there has to be an equal number within each, uh, with each end district. They make no rules as far as how that district is, it has to be shaped. So, knowing that, gerrymandering is when party officials draw district lines in a way that provides an electoral advantage for their party. And I'm going to show you in detail how this works in a minute. And again, this is typically the party in power that has the decision to decide what this procedure is. And so they typically give themselves total authority 
to draw these lines. Notice here, it, or it, um, if you're curious how it started, it was, uh, or how the name, how they got the name, it was named in 1812. So this is when it first happened for Massachusetts Governor Elbridge, Elbridge Jerry, who signed a law allowing the first gerrymander, which you can see this is where it was satirized in, the, in, the, in one of the major papers uh, after the law was passed to sort of criticize how, how dumb or maybe obviously how um, questionable it should be. So, and, it, and it basically what it does is it results in a higher proportion of the party's candidates winning seats than the proportion of vote. Now think about it. If, if it's a real democracy, then the proportion of people who voted for a Democrat or, or the Republicans should reflect the proportion of seats in there. I mean, that just, that makes sense to most people. Maybe you could debate that. Uh, but this, as you can see, gerrymandering throws that all out of kilter, and it makes it so one party has a lot more seat, a lot higher percentage of seats than they got percentage of the votes for those seats. And as I said, this is unlike the other forms that we looked, that's really are sort of structurally made to benefit Republicans, gerrymandering, and of course Republicans have been in a position lately to exploit this, but that could change. Historically, there's been times when Democrats have been the culprits, and have used gerrymandering to give the Democrats an advantage. Right now, it's mostly, we're seeing mostly results of Republican legislators gerrymandering, but again, if you think about the next election, I mean, power could flip back to the Democrats in the next election. Who knows? And if they do, then the, there's going to be a new census next year, right? So the Democrats that get elected now will have an opportunity to redraw everything in their favor. So Republicans and Democrats both have a motive for, for getting rid of this as soon as possible, I'm thinking. So how specifically does gerrymandering work? It works with a complementary strategy called packing and cracking, okay? Packing is where the person drawing the district line tries to pack as many of the voters in the opposing party into as few districts as possible. That's where the term packing comes from. Now, cracking, on the other hand, is where you draw district lines in a way that gives your party a slight advantage in there. So maybe you can see to be able to do this is contingent on having metadata that allows you to very accurately t tell in a, in a given geographic area how many people vote Republican and how many vote Democrat. And actually that data has now re is readily available, which is what Hoff, 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 I forgot his name, Hoff, um, Hoffeller. Um, it's kind of the one that first sort of realized and put those two together, and he hopped on the bandwagon, he capitalized on it, and he made a lot of money. Um, so you're packing your, your opponents in as few districts as possible, which means that they easily win those districts, right? But that's all they win, uh, so that they end up having a numeric minority in the overall Congress. And then cracking, uh, and, and that sort of uh, minimizes the efficiency of each vote, whereas cracking which is where you're trying to draw, draw districts where your party will get a slight advantage, that's going to maximize the efficiency of your own party votes. So using these two strategies in combination is what makes gerrymandering so effective, and it allows the ruling party, the party that's in power, uh, to dominate the elections, even though the opposing party obtains significantly more votes Using gerrymandering, the minority party can actually still glean more, more seats in Congress. Okay, um, this is a short video. Um, Brock Goodman and Chris Duance just came out. They just uh, directed and produced a documentary called Slay the Dragon. And Slay the Dragon is a metaphor for eliminating the gerrymander. And so I'm going to show uh, just a few minutes of an interview with a uh, CBS correspondent. And they're going to give you kind of a good idea Federal of what the entire Federal judges ruled Thursday that Michigan's congressional about. and legislative maps drawn by Republicans in 2011 violate Democratic voters' constitutional rights. The state's legislature must now redraw at least 34 districts for the 2020 election. 
Supreme Court is also set to decide a case this term involving partisan gerrymandering in Maryland and North Carolina. At issue is whether it's illegal to draw congressional districts based on which party is in control. The practice of gerrymandering has been going on for years. Here are some examples of gerrymandered districts. They include Texas 33, which looks like two upside down bats, Texas 35, the upside down elephant, North Carolina 12, snake there, and Louisiana to a mustache. <laughs> the new documentary, Slay the Dragon, from Participant Media, follows citizens' groups working to fight the practice. Here's a preview. We have brought together some of the best minds in the legal community, and we have studied so carefully the Supreme Court's jurisprudence on this question and built an evidentiary record that is so complete that, um, that I'm confident with it. I'm confident. I'll tell you, the future of our democracy depends on it. Eric Goodman and Chris Durant are directors of Slay the Dragon. Gentlemen, thanks to both of you for being with me. Congratulations on your documentary. So interesting, especially in light of today's news out of Michigan. You profiled, I think, Katie Fahey, correct, who was working for this. What do you make of the court's decision today? Chris, let's start with you. Fantastic. I mean, it's a huge, it's a huge, huge deal. 2020 was set to be a massive fight in uh, Michigan, with the elections being fought on the 2010 maps. And this basically you know, throws that ball up in the air. So huge, a huge win for democracy in Michigan. Barry, did you see this coming when you were following Katie? Not quite. Uh, Katie's fight was slightly different. Katie and her group, voters, not politicians, was trying to change the way that um, district lines are drawn in Michigan, basically taking the power away from the legislature and giving it to a citizens group. Um, and they won that fight, which was super inspiring to follow and, and to comprise the heart of our documentary film. Now, I think for a lot of Americans, the issue of gerrymandering is a little confusing. If you could break it down for us, there are two main types, correct? Packing versus cracking. Can you explain the difference? Um, yeah, well, they're very related to each other. Basically, if, if you're the party in power and you want to hold on to that power, you can discriminate against the voters of the opposing party by concentrating as many of them in, in as few districts as possible, so that they'll win those districts, but only a few of them, or spreading them out, that's cracking, to as many districts as possible, so they'll get a certain percentage, 20% of the vote, but we'll have no chance of winning those districts. So they, they work in lockstep, and they're both designed to dilute the power of the opposing party's voters. And of, co of course, both parties have been guilty of this. This is not just one party or the other. A famous example of gerrymandering happened in California uh, after the 1980 census, when the Democrats drew five new districts to uh, help them out. How has technology now changed to make this easier to do? The technological change is, is huge. Basically, what it means is that politicians can identify voters with a precision that has just been impossible until now. And I think that's what made 2010, which was really when gerrymandering came to the major leagues, made 2010 possible. It's the ability to pick voters with pinpoint precision and allocate them in a way to make that camera packing and cracking possible. Right. Now, another thing that you guys have sort of illustrated in your documentary was the rise of the Tea Party movement, one of that un and then unknown Mark Meadows, you know, came out of nowhere to defeat Heath Schuler. How has that factored in? So, uh, one of our on-camera uh, witnesses uh, says it very well. What happened in the Tea Party movement in 2010 is that this was a very strong political movement that swept into power with the help of, of uh, a lot of money and so on. And then the gerrymandered maps kept kept them in power. It's almost as if a seawall was built, so that usually there you know there are waves that come in and out. The seawall, the gerrymandered districts, kept that Tea Party wave in, right. and that's why so many Republican legislatures throughout the 2010s have been far to the right of the voters that. Put them there. So, what can the average person do? I mean, obviously, you are following some people who are fighting for it, like Katie there in Michigan. But what can the average person do? They see this and they say, "Hey, that's not fair." Is there anything a voter can do about it? Absolutely, and that's one of the inspiring things of the film. We make it clear, because we've seen this when we travel around the country, that you can't rely on politicians. You can't rely on politicians because they have no incentive to do anything about this. 
And you can't rely on the Supreme Court. It's not going to be, it's very unlikely to be a reliable player in this. Why do you say that? Because the court in the in the two in the two sets of hearings there are two big cases before the before the court, and in the, in the oral arguments it's it's clear from the questioning and it's clear from the makeup of the court since Justice Kennedy laughed as a cherry mandarin. So that leaves us. It's basically it's on us, and that's what we found in the film. But part of the problem it seems to me is that there are no clear instructions on how to draw district lines. Correct. I mean, there's sort of vague ideas around geographical right. sites, correct? Is well, that, there, there does that are, have to be clarified? There are a set of criteria that are, that are supposed to be followed fairly rigidly. The, the Constitution does allow for some political considerations to be applied in, in redistricting, and it's sort of inevitable. What the plaintiffs in these cases around the country are arguing is that there's a line over which you shouldn't be able to cross. You, just because you can have some political consideration doesn't mean you should have any political consideration. So, where is that line? That's the question. How does the Supreme Court say you can go up to here, but you can't go any further? And, That's been the problem. And, and you guys say you know it when you see it. If it just doesn't pass the smell test, it's political gerrymandering. Is that right? Absolutely. I mean, there's a, there's a fundamental, fundamental tenet in American democracy. Firstly, it's a one person, one vote. And secondly, the person that wins the most votes well, should win. Well, we electoral college, so that doesn't work on that. <laughs> in, state, yes. so yeah. in state houses yeah. and state legislatures where this is pernicious as well. That's, what, that's what's happening. And so the, 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 the party with fewer votes is winning more seats. And when they're losing, they're holding on to those seats. So I think that most Americans find that objectionable. That's right. Well, you've laid out a roadmap on what people can do about it. Barrick and Chris, thanks to both of you for being with us. And congratulations again Thank you on your film. Thank you so much. Okay, um, what I'd like to do now, if you've got a handout in front of you and you've got a pencil, um, I think, oh, Dallas, did you bring some extra pencils in case somebody um, doesn't have one? Okay. I'm going to take this out of slideshow mode so I can draw on it. Oh, great. Does anybody need one? Okay, here's what I'm going to teach you how to gerrymander, okay? And I'm gonna, we're going to do four different gerrymanders. The first one that I want to do is where we pack both parties equally. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to assume we have to draw eight districts. There's 24. You know, each of these letters represents a block of voters that, that follow a, that vote a particular way. And again, this is this represents the data that's now available to people, location where they are and what percentage of people uh, vote there. And that's the data and the computers that the programs that you can use. That, that, it, that is what made it so easy for Hoffauer to, to do what he's done. So this is, a, this is going to be a more simplified version, but it will demonstrate the principle for you. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to pack both parties equally. Remember, packing is where you draw a district so you can get as many of one party in that district as possible. So we're going to draw eight districts, so there's going to be actually three letters in each district. So what you want to do is to first, let's, let's pack a... A Democratic district first. Okay, so what you want to do, and I'm just going to pick the ones that I see. You can draw your gerrymanders any way you want, but I'm just seeing these three Democrats right here. Actually, you want to try and do this in a way that doesn't look like you're gerrymandering. So even though it's pretty hard to do, um, you, you want to try and do that. Usually, it's the last ones that, that that are left or the ones that are the gerrymanders. But let's just say these three Democrats right here, I'm going to pack those three into one district. So again, you can use any three. You just pick three. You, know, you might draw those three right there. You might draw those three there. You might draw those three there. But try and draw a district where you pack three and only three Democrats in there and only, you know, no, no Republicans. And that'll be your first packed Democratic district. Okay, everybody got one? All right, let's pack a Republican district. Let's see, I'm going to go with um, these three right here. But go ahead, pick three Republican letters and try and pack them all into the same district as I'm doing here with these three Republicans. So there I have a packed Democrat and a packed Republican district. Okay, now let's go back again. After you've got your second district drawn, go ahead and let's pack another Republican district. So again, see if you can find three Republicans that you can all pack into one district. And it needs to be three and only three. 
be careful not to cut off somebody that where you can't get to them in a later district. Okay, so now I have two packed Republicans and one packed de Democrat, so I'm going to pack another Democratic district by again finding three deeds and finding a way to draw a line so that I pack all three of those Democrats into one district. Does everybody see how I've done that? One, two, three, nobody else. It's voter data. They have it house by house, so just General area. Not house by house, I don't think, but I mean it may be down to neighborhood or or or, or uh, neighborhood block. Yeah, I'm not sure how exactly how, but it's plenty detailed enough to to, to draw these these gerrymanders. Okay, so let's see. I need to draw. I've got two Republicans. I need to draw another Democrat. I'm seeing one right here that looks pretty easy. Okay, now I'm going to try and pack a. Republican district. I'm just going back and forth. And the further along you get, the more difficult it gets. All right, there's an R. I don't want to leave that D out of there and get those two R's in there. And then we should be able to draw four packed Republican districts and four packed Democratic districts. One, two, three, there we go. Does everybody see how I've got that? And hopefully you've done the same thing. It, it probably won't look like mine. It may look very different from mine. But as you can see, I've got some districts that look normal and others that look really gerrymandered, don't they? That one, that one. Um, Maybe I'll name these gerrymanders since I sort of invented this. But um, <laughs> so you can see, if 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 there's sort of equality in in defining, you know, each party could go back and forth and pack the other party. You result in what? Four Democratic districts and four Republican districts, right? And that's the there's equal numbers of voters. So here we have equal numbers of voters and equal numbers of districts for each party. Okay, go down to your next one. And I'll show you how you can, you can uh, crack, crack both parties equally as well. Remember, cracking is where you put uh, two of your own party in a district and then just one of the opponent so that you know you'll barely outnumber them in the vote. So, for example, I'm going to draw my first crack district. Let's crack a Republican district. That means I want to draw a line so that there's two R's and one D in there, okay? So there's a district that's cracked for the Republicans. And then now I'm going to crack a district for the Democrats. So I want to put, find a way to put two Democrats and one Republican. Let's see, I think if I go like this, that will crack a Democratic district. All right, now I'm going to crack another Republican district. By getting what two Republicans and a Democrat, there's a there's a cracked Republican district right there, and then let's crack another Democratic district. In other words, two Democrats and a Republican. I'm not right there, maybe. And then go back and crack a Democratic district. Looks like. There's two Democrats. Oops. This is a little easier for you than it is me. Two Democrats and one Republican. And then I should be able to create one more of each. Okay, so one, two Republican and one Democrat. So I've got one, two, three, where's my fourth? One, two, three, four. I've got four Democrat districts that are, are cracked and four Republican districts that are cracked. So again, if you go back and forth, it comes out okay. The problem arises when 
you try and draw them to give one party an advantage. So on our, our next graph, and we're going to flip the page over, let's try and do what Hoff Hoffeller did. Basically, we're in packed Republicans and cracked Democrats. Okay, so first of all, let's pack a Democratic district. And again, you're free to do any one you want. I see an obvious one down here that's easy. I'm just going to pack these Democrats right here to begin with. And now I'm going to crack a couple of Republican districts. Okay, there's an easy one right uh, there. There's two Republicans and a Democrat. And There's two Republicans and a Democrat right there. All right, and then I'm going to uh, pack myself another Democrat district. Remember, I'm trying to get the Republicans in advantage, so I'm going to pack all those Democrats right there, and that should enable me to crack pretty much the rest for the Republicans. There's one right there that I'll crack for them. There. Okay, two Republicans and a Democrat right there, and then I got two Republicans and a Democrat right there. So when I do it in a partisan manner, what do I get? I get the Democrats are going to win two, two seats. The Republicans have cracked one, two, three, four, five, six districts. So you had 50% of the vote each way. But since the Republicans had the power to draw the lines, they won three quarters of the seats with only half the vote. Some would say that's not democracy. And just to show you, if the Democrats get in power, they can do the same thing. Watch me now, I'm gonna pack Republicans and crack the Democrats and give them an advantage. So there's three Republicans right there. And Crack a few Democratic districts. Let's see here. This is going to be tricky. short on time. Okay, so there's two Republicans and one Democrat. No, wait, I'm packing the Republicans. I didn't have that right. I'm getting confused here. Maybe it's not as easy as it looks. Okay, we were so just saying that over here at this table. Huh? We were just saying that. It's not as easy as it looks. You know, I think if you practiced it, it would get easy. I really do. Okay, so pack Republicans. We need three Republicans in this district, and then crack some Democratic districts, which means you get two, two D's and an R. Okay, there's a D, there's an R, so maybe you need to come up here and catch that D right there. All right, and then um, let's crack one more. That looks like a good place to pack Republicans, which I need to do, so I'm gonna pack those Republicans right there. And that should make it, fair, make it fairly easy for me to now crack the rest of these districts as Democrat. It may be a little gerrymander looking. Oops. It's easier with a pencil. <laughs> okay, so Democratic, Democratic, Republican. Mm. This is a good one right here. Mm. All right, there we go. 
All right, so you can see that. Now I've got two packed Republican districts and six cracked Democratic districts. So again, the vote is 50-50, but drawn this way, now the Democrats are going to get 75% of the seats. The Republicans will only get 25%. Did you have any luck drawing your gerrymanders? Okay, very good. So, how can we measure partisan gerrymandering? Um, you know, if we want to do something about it, we've got to be able to identify it. And this is sort of the new innovation that's come. It's called the symmetry standard, and it's very, actually a simple method. It just compares how similarly situated political groups would fare hypothetically if each in turn had the same percentage of the vote, which that's what we just did. I draw those maps with both parties had the same percentage of the vote. So that drawing those maps makes it very easy for us to compute the uh, partisan um, partisan um, bias of that of the electoral system. And if you think about it, we had 50% of the vote, but the, uh, the 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 losing party only gleaned two out of eight districts. In other words, 25% of the districts. So the measured partisan bias of that. If that system of drawing uh, districts uh, exhibits 25% of partisan bias. So this is a statement from, you remember from the video there was a lawyer that was from this team that argued that basically appealed to the district court in Eastern Texas to try and get them to declare a certain gerrymandered district as unconstitutional. And, and basically they, they presented the partisan bias formula and argued that it, the, the symmetry standard is a clear, manageable, and politically neutral measure of the particular burden a given partisan classification imposes on representational rights. In other words, it's a good measure of the degree to which the uh, effect of the vote differs from the, uh, the effect of the um, legislators that, that end up getting seats. I uh, actually gleaned some data from the state um, secretary of the Kansas Secretary of State, who, as you may know, uh, basically is in charge of running the elections in Kansas. And so I was able to glean the actual number of votes that were cast for Republicans and Democrats, as well as the number of seats that the uh, de Democrats and Republicans got in the most recent 2018 election. And as you can see here, there was a considerable amount of partisan bias in this. The Republicans only gleaned 54% of the votes, but they ended up with 75% of the seats. Similarly, Democrats who gleaned almost half, 44% of the votes, only ended up with a quarter of the seats. So if you do the partisan bias, you can see 21%. That's almost as high as we got when we were trying to do it as much as we could. Um, this is a chart showing the percentage of Republican vote for each of the four U.S. congressional districts. And basically what this is, means, you know, um, is, that, and, the, and the red are the district that the Republicans won, the blue is the district that the Democrats won. So you can see that the uh, Republicans who drew the last lines, they were successful at cracking the fourth district with 59% uh, of the vote. They were also very successful at cracking the second district with even less than half the vote. And this is true because a lot of people in Kansas vote for the independent candidates. So you don't have to get over half the votes to win, to get the most votes. Um, so they won with only 47% of the vote. Now, they're, they're, the Democrats won here, so you can see that they didn't quite crack District 3 enough. Well, they had plenty of votes in the first district. So if you think about it, if they had drawn their gerrymanders to somehow glean some more votes, from District 1, which as you may know is us, we're Western Kansas is District 1. If they gerrymandered to somehow get more votes channeled into District 3, they may have gerrymandered all four, well, you don't have to gerrymander Western Texas, or Western Kansas, because we're all Republicans out here, right? But they could have successfully gerrymandered um, and, and those three districts, all those three of those districts, and won all four of the congressional seats. This is the same analysis for the state representatives. Okay, that first one was for our four U.S. representatives. So this is the results of the state record of uh, the state House of Representatives. And as you can see, the uh, the, the partisan bias was not as high here. There's there are a lot closer uh, difference or a lot closer 
uh, between the percent of the vote that got, they got and the percent of seats. The partisan bias here, as you can see, was only calculated to 9%, but uh, it was, of course, in the uh, Republicans' favor because they, uh, they were the uh, party in power in uh, 2010 when they drew the last lines. And, you know, I also did an additional analysis where I counted the number of districts that the uh, Republicans won by uh, less than 10 percent or the ones that, uh, that, uh, that got more than 75 percent of a party pack. And as you can see here, um, the, um, there, there's a lot more uh, Republican uh, districts that were cracked and packed, but the ratio was not the same. And so, you know, what I get out of this is because Kansas is so strongly Republican, you really don't have to do a lot of packing and cracking to get a strong, strong majority uh, in the uh, in the state legislature. So, if we decide that partisan gerrymandering is is not a good way to have it, and if we decide that we really want to try and find some way to eliminate it, uh, we need to look at how we can stop that. Uh, you saw on the video that maybe the most common method that's been suggested or tried so far is to have some nonpartisan, quote unquote nonpartisan person or citizens group draw the district lines rather than the legislators or the, or the legislators in power. I don't know how well that turned out, but I mean it seems problematic to me because how do you determine objectively how a person or even a group is partisan or not partisan or which way they're partisan? I don't see too much promise in is that as a, as a solid solution to the problem. I think this concept of where we measure partisan bias is the key uh, to, to, to coming up with a, a system that's equal. My suggestion, I think this is one of the best. Of course, there's another one I think that's good too, but to place a cap on partisan bias as measured by the symmetry standard. You know, we could decide on a bipartisan basis, Republicans and Democrats could come together and decide, okay, how much partisan bias are we going to tolerate in our system? And it would usually be probably be some percentage. You know, maybe it's low, maybe it's high. Whatever it is, both parties would decide how much of an advantage the ruling party should get. And once that, that cap is established, then it would be legislated that, you know, any, if any election where the, um, of course, the ruling party could, could, would be allowed to draw the lines and then hold the election, and if the results of the election exceeded the partisan bias, then that election would be nullified by law. And my suggestion would be that then the opposite party would then get a chance to draw the lines. Now, if you think about it, that's going to put a motive for the party in power to maybe introduce a little bit of bias, but to limit it, because they know if we, if we try and push the envelope too far, we might exceed that bias in which we would have to hand over power now to the other party. They're going to be strongly motivated not to do that. So this strikes me as something that would work very well um, because there would be a motive for the party in power to limit the amount of partisan bias within this acceptable uh, standard. In, the, in other words, the end would be the amount of bias tolerated. If you remember, the line that shouldn't be crossed, to, to quote the video from, from Barrett Goodman. So if the, if the results exceed that percent, then the district lines are drawn by the party neighbor negatively affected. Whether you would hold a new election a lot could, uh, or not, it could be optional. If you just went by, this, by the vote that was already known, it would be very easy for the new party to draw it to max out, to, to get that bias very close to the limit. Whereas if they reheld an election, that then it would, it would be kind of uncertain as far as exactly what the results of any new, new uh, line of maps would, would result in. The other one, the other suggestion that I think holds a lot of promise is rather than allowing the majority party to draw the lines, have officials from each party take turns. So if you think about the first two exercises we did, that's what we did. We took turns drawing a map that each opposite party, you know, to each opposite party's advantage. They went back and forth and it resulted in closely, in other words, it resulted in a proportion of seats that matched exactly in our case, but would match very closely the proportion of votes cast. So to me, that is a very, um, that is a very uh, attractive uh, way to address gerrymandering. The ruling party could go first. That's what would give them some advantage. And you know, the, the, even even uh, Goodman and um, um, even the authors of, of the, the video uh, argued that you know that's fair. The ruling party should get some advantage. So going first would give them that advantage. 
and it should result in roughly equal numbers of parties, with the, again, with the ruling party getting uh, a slight advantage. The other way, way that's been proposed is to use some nonpartisan mathematical algorithm to draw these district lines. And to know what I'm talking about here, I've got a couple of simple examples with regard to the U.S. legislative districts, of which there are only four. So one way to do it would be to have some sort of an uh, abstract uh, line that runs directly north and south, and a computer would figure out the exact point east and west of where we reached the point where one-fourth of the population was west of that line. That would be defined as District 1. Then you do the same thing. You'd have a computer go, again, follow a north-south line until you get to the point where uh, another one-fourth of the people are there. And you just keep doing that, and basically all four districts would be drawn that way. It would meet the criteria of equal numbers in each one. And, uh, you know, any kind of partisan bias would be pretty much random. It would have to be the way geography just kind of randomly may have correlated with um, geography or with voting patterns. Whoops. I didn't mean to say thank you, goodbye yet. This is a, what I'm calling a radial pattern, and it's, it works the same way that way, except that you would find, again, a computer would determine the population middle of the state, and if the district lines would be based on radial. So it's very similar to this, it's just sort of oriented in a different way. Uh, the, the advantage to this one is you could have a, uh, you could pick a random number from one, from uh, zero or one to 360. You could have a random radial that you started on, uh, which would be fair to both sides. Or there may be, because um, again, computers, in addition to drawing these lines, could very easily calculate the partisan bias in each one. So you could actually generate several models this way that would have different amounts of partisan bias, and legislators could choose one that was within the established limit that they would have. Uh, then again, it may give them a slight advantage, but it would preclude the kind of extreme differences between proportion of voters and proportion of seats allotted that we're seeing with current partisan uh, gerrymandering. So I see that I am almost out of time. I, I'm sorry I didn't leave many time for questions and comments. I think we're supposed to be done here by 12.30, but do you have any comments or does any of these things make particular sense to you as well? Yes. So I don't really know how to like ask this question, but somewhere I've heard, perhaps it was in your class um, in Intro to Sociology, um, but gerrymandering also affects largely um, a part of like a social setting. So what I mean by that is it affects schools in urban areas, whereas if there's a specific line drawn, so gerrymandering, there's going to be a school in lower income communities and they will be left out to um, have that funding. Mm -hmm. So is that true or? You know, my understanding is that the school, um, the school board elections and the school bond elections, my understanding is that they have several separate districts for that. Now I imagine you could gerrymander uh, a school board district as well to get some sort of a, of a political outcome. Um, but that's, that's kind of, you know, school boards, that's, um, those, are, those are much more local, I guess I would have to say, types of, of elections that the, the districts for those usually just kind of uh, encompass the, the, the particular school district. But I, I think it's, it's highly possible that you could use gerrymandering for political purposes in, in those types of elections as well. Uh -huh. uh, I was going to ask if you were in charge, what um, bias percentage would you set as the acceptable limit? Mm, good question. Um, well, as a statistician, I know most confidence intervals are plus or minus four or five percent. So that's probably the area that I would say. You know, the lower you set that, uh, the more likely it's not going to be met, or it's going to be the easier it's going to be because people are going to definitely want to go over 50%, um, but you know, the more you can go, then the more guarantee you've got. So but that, that's a good question, and I think there would have to be a lot of discussion, maybe looking at historical election data 
to, to look at historically how have the how have the, the elections differed. Um, but you know that's that's subjective that you know people can differ on. I guess that would you know be something that legislators would have to decide based on the opinions of their constituents. And I guess about five, maybe between five, maybe seven percent, something like that. I would say. What would you say? I don't know, because um, I thought I, I at first thought like five percent, but then my worry would be that um, political campaigns would then aim at getting more people within certain districts to vote um, in a way that would then. Uh, exceed the bias ratio. Like if the election ended and you were able to get a lot more people to register to vote or to actually you know, go out and vote about, for their party. I thought about, I don't consider election. those dynamics. If you implemented something like that, you're right. The, the smaller, the party that did not draw the line, the party not in power, there may be some tricks they could use that would force the election to, to exceed the maximum limit. They may use some dirty tricks yeah. to uh, to actually get the other party to get more votes, which is sort of the opposite of what the party sort of like typically been motivated to do. To get a good draft pick. Yeah, that's that's a very interesting comment. I um, and it, you would need to think about that as far as whether this is the you know the best system or, or even a feasible system to use. Anybody else? Okay, well I hope you learned something, and I hope that uh, you know you got a big long life ahead of you and. I know when you're in college, it's you don't have time. You feel like you don't have time for politics. But again, I just can't point out how much most of you are eligible to vote, and how much whether you vote or not affects the way the government and politicians treat you. And you, I mean, it's very obvious. You look at the votes, like um, the people that vote high. Uh, you know, you see legislation tailored for those groups. They know that if you don't vote. They can shift the tax burden to you. They can pass policies. You know, the state legislators been cutting funding for your colleges and my college for years now. And that's the main reason your tuition goes inches up every year. If college students all voted, I can almost guarantee the legislature would not do that. They may even maybe have a tendency for them to increase funding because you would be such if you were an organized block, organized around your interests. Um, you know, they dump the tax burden on you. You guys don't have a lot of money, and the tax part of the tax policy is: do we tax more low-income or high-income people? And if low-income people don't vote, it's very politically easy to dump the tax burden on the class that doesn't vote. So I would strongly encourage you to, uh, and I'm going to do what I can to try and get a campus-wide enthusiasm for the 2020 election. I really hope the, um, I can work with Odalis to start a uh, voter registration drive here on campus. Uh, does anybody know where students vote? How easy it is for you to get to the polls here? Does anybody know? I think most students vote in their hometown, so they would have to go to some Okay. You know, and I... Um, I did absentee when I was a student about a year ago. Yeah, yeah, I did some a little bit of research in that, and, and, and my understanding is that you have the option of doing either one. You can vote back where your uh, prime permanent residence is, or you can also, I don't think you can vote both places, um, but there's no reason why you should. I mean, you live here more than you live back home, right? And I would argue that the, the policies of Kansas and even Hayes, and I don't know if you know it or not, but Hayes is, I've heard the only, certainly one of the few cities that gets its revenue from sales tax. And I don't know if you know what you know about taxes, but sales tax is, um, is the most regressive tax there is, which means that the, the, the less money you make, the higher percentage of your income you pay for sales tax. So that's another thing. If 40 students voted, they could probably get uh, Hayes to switch to funding their city with either property tax or in, probably property tax or income tax, that would give 40 students, I don't know how much, but it would give them extra money in their pocket because a high percentage of the money you spend is, on, is sales taxable, right? Food, drinks, fast food, you pay a sales tax on your textbooks. So again, if I would leave you, I know I'm over my time now, I appreciate everybody staying, but if I was just to leave you is uh, to tell you that, you know, when I was your age, I was just like you, or most of you. 
I didn't understand why it was important for me to vote, but boy, I sure do now. And, uh, and you know, my mission is to try and, and, and let you guys know what somebody really ad didn't adequately let me know when I was your age. Uh, because, you know, again, my life may have been a lot easier. When if, I was your my age, generation I didn't vote for Richard Nixon. Yay, me! <laughs> <laughs> you say you did or didn't? Did not. Okay. That was my first. My first. Oh, that was your second, first election. Second term. Yeah. Uh -huh. Do you know we've had voter registrations on campus? We had one in the library last year. There was I did not at least that. one in the union. So I, there's a there's a precedent for doing that if you want to get some people organized. Well, it would be nice if we could get a voting station right here in the library. Um, be very easy for students to vote as well as the citizens that live around the campus. It would be very easy for them to come here and vote. Lots of parking work lots. On that. <laughs> huh? You're in charge of working on that. <laughs> I think it has to be an actual precinct. Vote. I thought yeah, you were going to tell me, I thought you were going to tell me, well, if you if you try to push that, you better come volunteer to help me set up these voting machines. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to be on my list. <laughs> But so again, thank you very much, and I uh, hope you enjoyed this Times Talk, and uh, you know, keep your eye open, because I go to Times Talks a lot, and I always learn a lot, and they, they, um, they, they, they teach you stuff that's value, valuable information, not just for now, but for your future.